this is Ed Stetzer Live, and I'm Ed Stetzer. And this and every day at this time, every Saturday, excuse me, at this time, we come to you with conversations that I hope will be encouraging to you, uh, inform you, help you to live faithfully and fruitfully in the world in which we live today. Um, I'm actually broadcasting from Southern California. I am I serve as the dean of the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. But every Saturday, uh, for the, our purposes together, I'm your host here at Ed Stetzer Live. And we have a guest almost always. I think, don't think we've ever had a show without a guest, but we have a guest today as well. We're going to be taking your calls also. But let me tell you about the topic before we necessarily open up the lines for your calls. But our guest today is Jay Kim. Jay Kim serves as lead pastor of Westgate Church in the Silicon Valley of California. He's the author of several books, including uh, Analog Church, Analog Christian, and his most recent, which what, what we're going to talk about, is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy word, word, World. Boy, I'm having problems pronouncing words this morning, which isn't good for a radio host. He hosts Digital Examine podcast, and his writing has been featured in Christianity Today, The Gospel Coalition, and this is from his bio, Outreach Magazine, which I happen to be the editor of, so we love the fact that he writes, has written, and been featured on our magazine, in our magazine as well. So, Jay, we're so glad to have you here on the uh, on the radio show. A little ironic, though, is that, you know, a lot of this stuff is like, you know, analog church, analog Christian, and here we are on a technology on over 200 radio stations across the country. So I I'm, I'm hope you're okay stepping into non analog but into digital radio and we're glad to talk to you today uh thanks so much for having me ed yeah happy to be on through digital technology it'd be nicer if this was over a cup of coffee but glad to be on with you it is hard to do radio over a cup of coffee but we i bet the, the fine <laughs> folks at moody radio could figure out how to do that i'm not quite sure but anyway i'm glad you're here and i actually do appreciate your emphases as well i i first read analog church uh, and I think that was that your first book. It was first book I read just transparently. Was that your first book? Yeah, it was my first book came out okay. in March of 2020. <laughs> COVID, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> the irony was, uh, was, was awesome because again, yes. everyone went online at that point and, but, but you're, I think I really found it helpful just to be transparent and all of Jay's books are linked at edstetzerlive.com. You can always just click through there and we list the author and the books and, and, the, and his bio and all those sorts of things. But, but boy, sure. I mean, the, the timing of your most recent book, Listen, Listen, Speak, uh, which is, a, well, let's probably start with, it's a strange title. So tell us what you mean by Listen, Listen, Speak. It's not me stuttering, but it is actually a repeated word. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be honest, if the publisher would have let me, I probably would have had like 12 listens and then speak. But uh, that would not have made for a very good book title. Yeah, a lot of people will ask me, oh, is that, you know, the two ears, one mouth sort of thing? And I think that's probably partially true. But for me, the title comes from a, a reminder that I've learned to give myself in just about any conversation I'm having with anybody which um, I found myself a number of years ago, uh, not really listening, um, but instead, you know, hearing the words coming out of the mouth of whoever I was conversing with really just kind of as the backdrop for whatever it is I, I felt like I needed to say. And I found myself not really listening. I was hearing the sounds, hearing the words, but not truly listening. So um, it's a reminder to me on a personal level, you know, when I listen for the voice of God or the voice of others, I am listening for the sake of listening. It's an invitation to curiosity. You know, I wonder if there is more to it than this, um, to ask more questions than to try to give answers. And then to speak, if I sense, you know, by God's spirit, that there's something meaningful to say. So listening for the sake of listening and then maybe speaking, that's really where the title comes from. Yeah, that's, it's, it's rather counter, counterintuitive, which to be honest, a lot of your writing is counterintuitive. Sometimes when I see J. Kim, I see him sort of standing up against the, the totality of Western frenetic culture saying no, um, <laughs> which I think is probably good. I, I had a uh, seminary president friend who was in this kind of alliance of other seminary presidents. And he, um, he he would hardly ever speak, and I and I and I said to him, um, "Why do you never, you know, talk in this?" Sometimes the group was a little rambunctious, and I would say unhelpful. Mm -hmm. And he said, "You know, I just learned that the Bible consistently teaches that it's better to not speak and to listen." And he really just made that his life. But I think part of the challenge is is that that's not what people expect from 
leaders today or, or for people today. You know, you got to post on social media. You got to share your opinion on about everything. So, so it's rather a counterintuitive message to be the kind of person who listens. But, but I do wonder what the world would be like if we actually, if we did more of that and less of the other. So how did the Lord sort of put this theme on your heart? Where, I mean, it does relate to your prior books, so maybe it's just, you know, a life message. But tell me how this theme sort of bubbles up in your heart. Yeah, it was really born out of my own frustration. Um, initially, uh, in increasingly so in recent years, my own um, growing inability to clearly hear the voice of God. And I just, I knew reading the scriptures and studying the text and really from past experience, I knew that there was a way um, to attune my heart and my mind to the voice of God. Uh, but it felt so much like I had forgotten how. And the more I considered it, I realized, like you said, Ed, it connected in some ways to my previous books. I realized that in large part, it was because my body had become so accustomed to noise and to frenzy and you know chaos and cacophony is the way I describe it in the book where everybody's talking, everybody's shouting, no one's really listening. And I came to the conclusion that one of the reasons I was struggling to hear the voice of God so very much was because I was listening for volume. And the reason was everything was volume in my life. Everything is loud. Everything is noisy. And as I studied the scriptures and, again, considered my own experiences, I came to the realization, you know, God is not really interested in speaking loudly most of the time. Throughout the scriptures, it seems that God is most interested in speaking clearly. And there is a difference. He wants clarity to cut through the chaos. And, you know, I think a lot about the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19. It's a famous story where he goes up to the mountain because he's on the run fearing for his life, and he encounters God on the mountain. And uh, the this, this story is very intentional in telling us that God is not in the chaos. Um, God is not in uh, the, the earthquake and the windstorm and the fire. And then it tells us that God speaks in a gentle whisper. And again, I, I realized in my own life, those are the moments that I have most clearly heard God in gentle whispers. So I went on a journey to figure out a way to, uh, again, align and attune my life, my practices, my behaviors um, toward the gentle whisper of God, and then to find in that place um, the confidence to be able to speak uh, lovingly, but clearly to a world that, again, is just in utter frenzy and chaos. Yeah, the you you put the words hearing God in the title. Of course, that reminded me of Dallas Willard's book by Hearing God as well. And there's some yes. you know some, some emphases that you could pick up between the two. But you, always the question, and we're, I'll, I'll ask this question because if I don't, the callers will I think rightfully ask this question, but I'll give them other questions to ask as well. Is what do you mean by that, and what does that look like, and what is that what is that experience like? Yeah, you know, I've never heard the audible voice of God. I've had some experiences and moments in my life when um, I felt like it, it was very close to audible, but those moments are few and far between. It's interesting as finite human beings, when you and I think about hearing something, we are, and in particular, thinking about hearing spoken words, we're, we're talking about human language and human beings making certain sounds with their mouth, you know, as they breathe the air through their lungs. And uh, those sounds are infused with meaning. And then uh, that meaning does something in our minds. So the fact that, you know, Ed, you and I are having this conversation on a very literal level, you and I are just sort of making sounds with our mouths. And we've got folks who are listening to those sounds. But as they listen, the sounds you and I are making are in many ways directing their thoughts, right? People are thinking about particular things because of the sounds that we are making. And that's the way we do it uh, as, as finite human beings. We use human language and the written word and on and on, body language and, and other things. But God is not finite. God is infinite. And so he is able to direct our thoughts 
in a very literally direct way, you know, without necessarily making sounds, without necessarily using words or even written language, although he has obviously done that through the scriptures. So, you know, you mentioned Dallas Willard and his book, Hearing God, which has been so influential and impactful in my own life and, and in many ways shaped the writing of this book. He's got this incredible line in Hearing God um, that was a paradigm shift for me. He says that our failure to hear God's voice when we want to is due to the fact that we do not in general want to hear it, that we want it only when we think we need it. And I remember years ago, the first time I ever read that, you know, highlighting it in the book and then sitting there, I was at a coffee shop up in Berkeley. I still remember it. I remember sitting there highlighting that line and then being unable to continue on with the book for a while. I just have to think about that because I realized, man, that's it. I think one of the reasons why I struggle to hear the voice of God so much is because I am only sporadically listening for it. But I think one of the ways to, to become the sorts of people who can listen for the voice of God in all of life at all times is to live with our entire selves, again, aligned and attuned to his voice, directing our thoughts, guiding our minds, um, cultivating our emotions uh, throughout all of life to not just listen when we think we need to hear the voice of God as a sort of last resort, but to um, posture ourselves to be listening for the voice of God uh, at all times and all things. And I think when we can do that, um, everything begins to change. And we realize that God is speaking all the time, directing our thoughts and our minds and um, that he has something to say. And uh, that's a, a lesson I'm still learning, but it's been, it's been life-changing for me. Hmm. Jay Kim's our guest. His new book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a noisy world. Our phone number for your calls. Maybe you'd like to question about, you know, how you might grow to have that kind of intimacy with the Lord, or maybe to share your own journey and how you kind of able to push some things aside to get focused on the Lord. Our number is 877-548-3675. You'd be live with me and Jay Kim. We're giving away some copies of his book to brilliant callers as well. 877-548-3675. Hey, we're back. It's Stetzer Live. I'm Ed Stetzer here with Jay Kim. We're talking to him about real, really maybe decluttering your life in some ways uh, so you can hear uh, God's leadership in your life and be heard in a noisy world. And so the title of the book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. And I would confess that, that what came to my mind was you had, you know, two ears and one mouth. I think it's what my mother told me when I was a child that mm -hmm. I needed to hear. So um, I think everyone's going to kind of take those listen, listen, speak and sort of make it their own in some way. Um, but you're writing this book in a time that is probably, I mean, not probably, certainly unique in the history of people is that literally things can, can just come at us every moment of, of every day. I was, I was recently, I was sitting in my, my living room doing some work and I was typing an email while the news was on in the background because it was some significant news thing I wanted to watch and I was running a podcast at the same time. And my wife came in, Donna came in. I was, I was tangentially listening to the news because it was a big night of news and I was waiting for something to come on. And she said, are you typing, listening to two things at the same time? And really, I wasn't. I was, like I said, I had it on the background. <laughs> but the fact that it was an, even an acceptable alternative to have a TV playing in the background and then have a podcast playing that I was actually listening to while typing some things just shows how bizarro there were. And my, that was my wife's words. She called me bizarro at that time. And I love that woman. She's the only woman who's allowed to call me bizarro. Um, so, so, but, but the, the reality is technology has created all that. And, you know, I, I, you know, we're not that far away from people having glasses that they can, um, you know, I think the current Apple uh, situation is not where it's going to be, but eventually they're going to be glasses that people are reading things, the heads up displays, all this sort of stuff. So, I mean, how do we get a hold of this now? Because it seems like it's mostly gotten a hold of us and we're being more shaped by the flow, the frenetic flow of information than, again, the word of God, the spiritual disciplines. And again, I mentioned earlier, you seem to me like you're this one guy standing up trying to hold back a hurricane and 
and I don't know. I think you're awesome, but I I I I wonder how much we're going to be able to hold it back. Let me let me just remind people of our phone number, as well, because um, they might ask and weigh in as well. It's eight seven seven five four eight three six seven five. Again, eight seven seven five four eight three six seven five. So knowing that I believe in your cause, your cause is just J Kim. Is is there hope to actually get to be the kind of people that you describe and listen, listen, speak, hearing God and being heard in a noisy world? I believe that there is. Yeah. You know, I can obviously relate. And I think most of us listening can relate to what you're saying. And um, in the last decade alone, media consumption amongst Americans is up more than 20 percent. In the year 2011, the average American spent about 45 minutes a day on their phone. Today, the average American spends over four hours a day on their phone. I mean, you think about just four hours a day, what that means for your waking hours. If you're awake 16 hours a day, that's 25% of your day on your phone. There was a writer named Annie Dillard, and uh, she famously wrote many years ago, the way we spend our days is the way we spend our lives. So if that's true, and it is true, then 25% of your life, over a quarter of your life, is spent scrolling and swiping and clicking buttons on a black box. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if we if we want to live as sort of like eulogy people, you know, every single day, uh, live with an awareness that this is the eulogy we are writing with our lives, is that what, what, what we want our eulogies to say? Oh, gosh, Jay lived a wonderful digital phone addicted life. I mean, of course not, you know, and some, some people know the statistic that the average smartphone user touches, like physically touches their phone more than 2,600 times a day. That, that includes every tap, every little click, every swipe, you know, every scroll. I mean, that's insane. And so uh, in the midst of all of that, yeah, the question, is there hope? And the reality is I believe that there is hope uh, but it is going to require active participation. Um, there's a psychiatrist named M. Scott Peck, and he talks about the gift of attention. And specifically, he says that attention is the gift of love. Like um, specifically, his words are that the, the principal form that the work of love takes is attention. When we love something or someone, we, we have to make the effort to set aside our existing preoccupations and, and shift our attention, and that attention is an act of will. So there is hope in the sense that every single one of us has that gift to give to God and to one another. We have the gift of our attention. It is at our disposal, and it is available, readily available, every waking moment of every single day. And it doesn't go away. Like you always have it. You will never not have it. Attention span is decreasing, but um, the gift of attention itself is always there. And I think because of that, there is hope. If we can harness the gift of our attention and begin to learn to focus that attention in the proper, appropriate direction, then, um, yeah, we can live listening lives where we hear the voice of God and one another with clarity and then speak uh, with clarity and with love. Yeah, and that's, that's what I want. I mean, who doesn't want that? But, but how do I, like, I mean, just one of the things that, you know, I, I'm at the Talbot School of Theology. I think you're a fuller grad, if I recall. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we have at Talbot... Uh, John Coe leads our spiritual formation uh, program, Institute for Spiritual Formation, and he was a kind of a disciple of Dallas Willard. So this is a major theme. Like we just had baccalaureate night before last and the hooding ceremonies, people got their masters and their doctorates. And I think every, they write a little something that the, they, they read when they come across the stage and everyone that went through spiritual formation just talked about the life transformation, the huge change. We We think it's a real it's a real seminary malpractice to send out people who aren't well shaped and formed spiritually. So that's a key part of what we do. But you know, I'm I'm of a different wiring. My Donna, my wife, we we, we have a friend named Mindy Caliguire. I think you probably know Mindy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Mindy says that you know Donna's a candle burner, and and I'm kind of a jet fuel drinker. And so I have this <laughs> very different personality. And so I'm around John Coe, and I'm around our spiritual formation people. 
and I want that, but I'm not naturally inclined towards that where Donna and, and maybe you, Jay, I don't know, are more naturally inclined towards that. So what would you say to people like me who kind of like the hustle, the bustle, kind of engaging and embracing and trying to tame the chaos, uh, which sometimes people who are more, I don't know, people who write books like Listen, Listen, Speak tend to have a different personality than people like Ed Stetzer. And is that just because you <laughs> learned it or how do you get, how do you get there? Help people like me, Jay, be, be my, be my spiritual, spiritual director for a minute. Yeah. I mean, I think I do. You're right. It's, it's true. I probably have because of my personality and, and some other things, I have an inclination, a sort of proclivity toward quiet and toward isolation which can be dangerous in many ways and at the same time ed you know i would tell you i um serve as the lead pastor of uh you know a fairly large certainly large for the san francisco in the bay area it's huge church you know it's a multi-congregational three congregations and two different locations and thousands of people on a sunday and lots of staff all those things so I, I'm sort of a mixed bag. I mean, yes, I think my natural inclination is to sort of hole up in my office, literally light a candle and spend time reading and studying. But I would also say this, um, you know, the sort of imagery we have in our minds that a person sitting quietly in a dimly lit office with a good book is somehow not distracted. But the reality is if the goal for the Christian is to live a life of deep listening to God and um, to live in constant awareness of his loving presence. Well, even if you're sitting in a quiet room with a good book, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not distracted. It just means that that distraction looks like something else. And at the same time, like I said, I'm a mixed bag. And so there is a part of me, you know, when I um, get into the office on Monday and I sit with our leadership team and, you know, our directional team, there's about eight of us around the room and we always begin our Monday with prayer. And then it's like off to the races. It's two and a half hours of what, what's happening this week, what's happening in the next right. month and the next quarter. And I like you, I, I can be that guy. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> living and, and abiding by my task list and my calendar. So I face, some of the same changes. And, you know, I wish I had a, a an easier answer, but really what has worked for me is just, a, you know, this is a Dallas Willard line that um, our friend John Mark Comer uh, used for the title of, of a book a couple of years ago. But, you know, I have found that like really being militant about ruthlessly eliminating hurry in my life yeah. and aligning myself to the particular disciplines that I've committed to that is the path. And so I, I have practices that I think, you know, are probably more descriptive than prescriptive, but I do have morning practices, breath prayer practices throughout the day, and then a particular way that I end my day, both with my family and on my own. And and I'm just, I, I am ruthlessly committed to those practices. Um, and I think that's been the path forward for me. And it's not that, you know, that time spent with the Lord, whether it's the daily examine or praying the Lord's prayer or practicing breath prayers. These are all things that I do on a daily basis. It's not that they're these like incredible mountaintop moments all the time. Most of the time it's quiet. And and sometimes honestly, it's quite boring and distraction sort of fights against it even in the moment. But I have found over the long haul, over the course of many months and years, practicing these things has really shaped me and formed me into the sort of person who can live at a different sort of pace. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, you mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier the examine and you just mentioned it again. That's not a normal thing that, that probably most people have heard of. So kind of explain a little bit about, about what that is. Let me remind people that we're taking their calls. Our number is 877-548-3675. Uh, we're talking about really about listening well, hearing from the Lord, being heard in a noisy world. The title of the book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. We're going to give a few copies that away to people who have brilliant, insightful questions or comments. And you can call with those, not just like a book giveaway, uh, but you can call to share your thoughts, your input, your questions at 877-548-3675. We've got about a minute before we need to take a pause, but tell us, Jay, what, what is the examine in this context? 
Yeah, the Prayer of Examine was developed by Ignatius of Loyola in the 15th century. He's, um, he's the founder of the, the Society of Jesus. We know them as the Jesuit order today. And put very simply, the Examine is a very simple, accessible prayer practice where um, you slow your, your mind and your heart down and go through these sort of five key movements with God. Um, essentially, you uh, sit in his presence. You invite him to make you more aware of his loving presence. You thank him for the day that's been. Um, you reflect on your various emotions from that day and you pay particular attention to the, the challenging emotions and you just you sit with God in that pain and then you confess, you know, the brokenness or sin from your day and then ask God to go with you into the next day, you know, whatever it is you need from him. And so it's this very simple practice that um, I have found transformative in my own life. Good deal. When we come back, we're going to take your calls, 877-548-3675 here on Ed Stetzer Live. Hey, we're back at Ed Stetzer Live. I'm Ed Stetzer, the Dean at the Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. Our team here at Moody Radio is always appreciative of your taking the time to listen. Karen Henders, our producer, Bob Moreau, our engineer, and Laura's man on the phones. We're thankful for them. We've got some good calls coming as well. Let me just give you one more opportunity to jump on the line, and then I'm going to go to Michael in just a second. Michael and Dayton, you're up, going to be up first, but our number is 877-548-3675. Again, 877-548-3675. Seven seven five four eight three six seven five. So let's go first to uh, Michael in Dayton, Ohio. Michael, you are live on the air with your question, your comment. Go right ahead. Yes, I was telling your call screener this sounds like something I really need because it seems like I'm just running headlong into my day, busy, 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 busy. And so, what's a what's a good mindset or way to get this started to sort of back everything down and, and start over. Yeah, I like that. Like, let me, if you hold on to it, I want to give you a copy um, of the book, Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. Jay, what do you think about Michael's question? What's a good way to get started? It's a great question, and I think that's really what it comes down to. We have to ask the pragmatic question. Okay, these are great ideas, and, and this is what I want, but what do I actually do? So again, I think at a, at a high sort of 30,000-foot view level, I think it's important for us to take stock, to take inventory of several things. One, um, our media diet, you know, what you consume forms who you become. And so I think it's important that we ask ourselves, what am I consuming? And for most of us, not all of us, but for most of us, I think it, when we're really honest with ourselves and just take sober assessment of the cycle of our lives and the rhythms of our day, we live in the noisy cycle of what I would call a media saturated life. We consume so much media that includes news media, social media, entertainment, sports scores, whatever it might be. These are all ne not necessarily bad things, but um, we have to ask how much of it am I consuming? Uh, because the reality is that's forming you. So I think we have to ask, okay, what am I consuming? How much of it am I consuming? And then be sober uh, about the fact that it is now forming you. It's consuming you. And I think, you know, a media saturated life leads to panic and reaction. You know, you think about the concept of doom scrolling. This is something people do all the time. Sadly, it's something a lot of people do. The first thing they wake up in the morning, they open their news app and they're just wondering what terrible thing happened in the world last night mm -hmm. that um, I missed. And then it just adds to the adds fuel to the fire. We, we become immensely exhausted and then we, we sort of consume some more to try to appease the tension that we feel. And um, so I, I think we have to begin to disrupt those cycles. So I, I mentioned it earlier and I say this, you know, again, to be descriptive, not prescriptive, but just in case there's some helpful tools in here for folks. For me, a couple of things come to mind. Um, my phone does not sit on my nightstand. So I have an analog alarm clock 
meaning the phone is not the last thing I look at before bed. It's not the first thing I reach for when I wake up. I have to like actually get up, go make my cup of coffee, and my phone is sitting there docked in our kitchen. So I think there's physical things we can do. Um, some other things we can do is like begin to delete apps from our phone. When I uh, spend time, you know, I have a digital Sabbath one day a week and uh, one to two weeks a year, and I delete everything. I delete um, my email from my phone, so I just don't have access to it. So I think there are practices we can put in place. And then throughout the day, uh, I practice breath prayers. I end my day by praying the prayer of examine, which is really time spent in the presence of God with God. I do that with my family, including our two young kids, uh, as well as, as my wife and I, and then on my own once they're in bed. So I think we have to take stock of our media consumption, our media diet, and then identify places where we can make changes and replace that consumption with scripture, with prayer, which is really focusing our attention on God. And, um, you know, those sort of long, quiet, sometimes boring stretches of just sitting in the presence of God. This is, again, one of the things that, you know, Ignatius and others taught us to do. And uh, it's been transformative in my own life. You know, two weeks from now, I'll be doing the show live from the UK. I'm teaching um, at Oxford for a couple of weeks at Wycliffe Hall. A hall at Oxford is mm. a place that trains ministers and pastors. Uh, they call them ordinands, Anglican ordinands. And every morning while we're there, I'll have some of my Talbot School of Theology students come and we take joint classes with the Wycliffe Hall ordinands. But uh, it'll be new for the Talbot students, and but a regular practice for the Wycliffe ones that every morning we'll go to the chapel and we there's a liturgy that begins the day uh, with this. It's an Anglican evangelical school and kind of resets. There's even a phrase in it, you know, the, the night has ended, the, the dawn has come, you know, we step into this day as followers of the Lord. And there's a rhythm to that. And a lot of what you're talking about is creating, we all have rhythms and, and you have rightfully called out that our rhythm is to look at our phone, the last thing at night, Don and I maybe watch some reels that we find funny, uh, but then mm. the phone gets picked up. I don't have an analog alarm clock because um, I live in 2024, you don't. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but I like that. I mean, I think that there's good stuff. I, saw, I heard someone, a pastor once say, you know, I put my open Bible on my nightstand. So I read it the last thing I go to bed, I pick it up, I look at it the first thing in the morning. So there are better rhythms that shape us. And that's part of what Jay talks about. And listen, listen, speak, hearing God and being heard in a noisy world. Let's go to James down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. James, you're live on the air with your question and your comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, mine probably dovetails in just a little bit with what he had just said. Because uh, my question was, I noticed in the last few years, say you go to stop and get gas and somebody's got the radio blaring. Uh, if you go to a theme park, uh, no matter what line you're in, there's always screens going. Uh, and, you know, and, and it, that's just, we're just saturated with it. And I did not know in the hint, the, the help hint, I think we may have lost you, James. that out a little oh. bit more if, if it was possible. I don't, I don't know. Uh, so I'm just wondering, for, you know, a little bit of guidance on that, how to help us more be personal with it because, I see it as a spiritual battle. I think it seems like the devil's trying to just crowd out everything, uh, any quiet time that would draw us back to God. Now, that's the way I see it, but i just like your thoughts on that. Yeah, let's, uh, James, we, we we lost you a little bit in the middle of the call, but I think we got pretty much everything we're talking about. If you'll hold on, though, Karen Henderson's going to come on and give you a copy of Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. And last chance for anyone who wants to call, 877-548-3675. So, Jay, he's talking about the multiplicity of screens. Like, I'm, I'm right now sitting here, and I got one, two, three, four screens looking at me uh, to pull off this radio program. But that's pretty normal. You know, even when I'm sitting watching television, I got a laptop in my lap. Um, so how do we break away from this cycle? You shared a little bit about it, but also give us some examples uh, from the book. And you talk some even in there about things like prayer and reading the Bible, even attending church, um, other environmental things. Talk to us about how we break away from some of those patterns. Yeah, you know, I, I wish I had a sort of quick fix answer, but, you know, like James said, it, it's true. We live in a culture and it's not changing. It's so we have to reckon with the fact that this is our world and it is going to become 
increasingly digital, increasingly technological. Um, there was a social commentator in the late 20th century named Neil Postman, not a Christian, but a brilliant man who famously wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he he was commenting on television and specifically what television was doing to us as human beings. But he's got these great set of questions that we need to ask about any technology that ever comes our way. It's these seven questions, but two in particular are really important. He says, we have to ask the question, what problem does this technology solve? And then we have to ask the question, what new problems does this technology introduce? And so again, I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. The hard answer is we have to begin asking that question of every screen, every technology that is before us. And then with discipline and commitment and resolve, begin to make decisions about what technologies we will at least in part remove from our lives as we weigh the pros and the cons. What problem does this smartphone that I'm staring at for four hours a day, what problems does it solve, but what new problems are being created? And I think when we ask those questions, the answers really become pretty clear. I mean, James is, is saying it right now. So, you're, you know, James is right. We don't control how many screens and how much technology and how much distraction, potential distraction bombards us throughout our day. What we do control and what we can never relinquish is our um, ability to harness our attention. So getting really, really practical, sort of repeating myself here a little bit, but I would say taking inventory of your smartphone. You know, I, I think it, the data bears this out when, when you look at recent data from people like Jonathan Haidt and Gene Twenge and others. Our smartphones specifically are having an actual, literal, physical, physiological effect on our on our lives. They're they're actually like physically impacting, you know, our, our lives and our health. And so, similar to to what you might do with your physical diet, you know, like why do I feel so bad? Oh, well, it's because I've just been eating fast food for a week straight. Like you wouldn't do that. Most people would not do that. And if they do, then they would say, you know what? I think I need to mix in a salad or do a little more cooking at home. I think we need to do the same with our own, with our digital diets. So uh, a couple practical things might be, you know, when, when do you log on to email and why? You know, there's some statistics about how often people jump into their email inbox and it's really staggering. And much of the time, it's unnecessary. Or um, the applications on your phone, how many of these apps do you really need? And the ones that you don't need, what, what, can, what would it look like to delete them? You know, maybe it inconveniences my life a little bit, but when I measure the inconvenience over and against the incredible detrimental effect it's having on my health, both spiritually and physically, the decision becomes pretty clear. So I think taking stock of our media diet, our digital diet, and then doing the hard work of um, eliminating those things that are destructive to our lives, I think that's probably the first step in the right direction, uh, even though you can't control you know, how much distraction bombards you from the outside in, you can control what you can control. So that would be my encouragement. It's a good word. It's a good word and really helpful advice here. Again, the book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. I also would recommend to you his prior book, Analog Church, Analog Christian, helpful things, resources from Jay Kim. They're all linked at edstetzerlive.com. You can find uh, well, his bio and more there as well. we got one more segment, and we're going to go pretty quickly to the calls. If you want to jump in, this is the time, 877-548-3675. Hey, we're back at Stetzer Live. I'm at Stetzer, continuing our conversation with Jay Kim. His new book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard 
in a noisy world. We're having some good conversation about some of these themes. What do they mean? How do we live them out? This is our last segment for calls, 877-548-3675. We're going to go to some calls and callers right now. I want to encourage you to be right to the point so we can get in uh, to as many calls as we can. So callers, please, please get right to the point when we jump over to you. Nita, we're going to go to you first. Nita in Florida, you're live on the air. Jump right in. Nita, you you don't seem to be there. I'm going to come back in just a bit. Bob in Chicago, you're live on the air with your question or comment. Jump right in. Yes, God has given us the answer. He says, be still and know I am God. Hmm. You know, what, what would happen if we had a conference, a men's conference or any other conference, and that entire hour is spent being silent hmm. and hmm. listening for it God? Is, yeah. It is interesting, Bob, how that's such a foreign concept to us today. We can't even have silent times and services. We have to have music playing underneath. Bob, I want to give you a copy of Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. And silence in, in, in the poor course of this conversation. How, how does that work? What does silence look like and feel like as a spiritual discipline, Jay? Yeah, because like Bob said, because we live in such a noisy world, silence is unfamiliar and it's uncomfortable. So my invitation, again, just trying to be pragmatic and practical here, I I agree. I think that quieting the noise in a literal way is really important in in, uh, the day and age in which we live. But I would also invite and encourage listeners, when you step into moments of silence that you carve out your day, I, I would say expect it to be awkward expect it to be boring expect it to be strange it is an acquired taste and um once you can tap into the gift that is silence it become it changes everything but early on i think it is so strange at least it has been for me and bob's you know quoting psalm 46 what's so interesting about that psalm to me is Toward the end, God says, be still and know that I am God. But if you read the rest of the psalm, he says that within the context of a world that is in utter disarray and chaos. It's absolutely noisy. The earth gives way. The mountains fall into the sea. The waters roam and fo- uh, roar and foam. Mountains quake with surging. I mean, it's just madness. And uh, there's so much hope there that in the midst of the chaos, we can be still and know that he is God. So I think that's a, that's a profoundly important encouragement from Bob. So good. Let's go to Kate. She's listening on Moody Online. Kate, you're live on the air. Go right ahead. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, first time I ever heard from the Holy Spirit, he kept me from having, a, um, I don't know, it, it, he warned me, put my seatbelt on and take the cruise control off. And within five minutes, I rolled my van. But I, wow. it was the first time I'd ever heard the Holy Spirit, and there wasn't a scratch on my van. I was safe, and there was a 30-car pileup. And so that got my attention, and I always wanted to listen to God. I love it. But I can't get enough of hearing from God. I, I put Him first in my life, and I want more and more of Him. But I don't know how to get Him to talk to me more. Okay, let's okay, let's let's jump uh, jump and have Jay share. I'm gonna if you hold on the line too, we're gonna give you a copy of his book. Listen, listen, speak, hearing God and being heard in a noisy world. Jay, what do you think? How might she open up her heart to hear from the Lord more? Yeah, it's a wonderful story, Kate. Thank you for sharing that and uh, really profound. I, I would say, you know, I would go back to what I said earlier that. Um, God is always speaking, that God is not limited to, he can use, but he is not limited to spoken or written word. And so the deeper we live in communion with God, I think as you pay attention to your thoughts and to your emotions, um, to your inklings, there is a way in which the spirit of God is, is speaking to you. So I think it's important for us to expand the boundaries of what it looks like, what it feels like, how we experience God speaking to us. Two, I would also say he has already spoken. If it is true what the scriptures claim about themselves, that the word of God is active and alive, then that means that these ancient texts that we call the library of scripture, the library of the Bible, these are actually living, breathing words of God 
um, speaking to us today. So, you know, the question, how do I hear him more? I guess practically uh, two things. One, pay attention to how the spirit of God is moving you. How, your Again, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions throughout the day as you live in communion with God. And then two, juxtapose that and compare that to the fact that to the words that God has already spoken, that he is continuing to speak uh, to you through his word, through the scripture. So um, his voice is accessible. It's right in front of us all the time. Good deal. We're going to go to Dillian for our last call. I think I said that correctly. Dillian, jump right in with your comment. Uh, yeah, I just, I just had a little encouragement um, for the sake of sounding cliche, but nature is a, is a, is a big help for getting away from technology and everything that distracts us. And at the same time, while you're in nature, even though the distractions it offers are usually lessons, you know, that God's put in place there, you know, observing animals, whatever's there, uh, there's something mm-hmm. to learn, and it's almost always godly. It's a good, but, it's a good uh, word, Dillian. Way- I want you to, Dillian, we, we got to take a pause because we're about at the end of the show. If you'll hold on just a second, we're going to give you a copy of Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. Uh, Jay, we got about a minute. What kind of final exhortations would you give us towards slowing down, unplugging in some ways and plugging in more deeply to what the Lord has for us? We've got about a minute left. Yeah. You know, again, the words of Annie Dillard, the way you spend your days is the way you spend your life. And you have this one precious life that God has given you. So how you spend today is the way you will spend your life. And my encouragement would be um, that you spend the day with the giver of life, um, God, who desires to give us life and life to the full, both now and on into eternity. So good. I want you, to, my listeners, to know that J. Kim ministers to me. And so he challenges me, and I want to do the same for you. His new book is Listen, Listen, Speak, Hearing God and Being Heard in a Noisy World. I'd go back and also recommend Analog Church and Analog Christian, all linked at edstetzerlive.com. To hear today's program again or to download it as a podcast, you can actually go to edstetzerlive.com or on the Moody Radio app. And you can connect with us through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at Ed Stetzer Live. Thanks for listening today and every Saturday. Remember, Ed Stetzer Live is a production of Moody Radio, and Moody Radio is a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Thanks for taking the time to listen to Ed Stetzer Live.